from the GNU Linux Users Group and welcome to the second video of this reverse engineering series. In the previous video, we discussed about what reverse engineering really is and some of the basic terms and concepts associated with CPU, memory architecture, along with a brief discussion on tools used over here. And before moving ahead, I would highly recommend you to watch the assembly refresher video made in the PWN series because we will be dealing with a little bit of assembly over here too. In this video, we are going to learn some basic reversing concepts with the help of teaching a binary written in C and compiled in a Linux machine. The program has four levels which teaches something new in each level related to reverse engineering. So without wasting any time, let's start. And yes, the link to the binary is given in the video description. No matter how hard the challenge is, you should always start by analyzing the binary like what it is doing. So as you can see, the program is asking us to enter a key. And if we enter a random key, it prints out the denied message. So our objective for this level would be to reverse the program and find out the proper key which will give us the access. Let us try out some basic reversing techniques we know so far. Using strings, we just find no luck as it gives out some gibberish which is not of any use for us in this case. Since the binary is quite long, strings are not useful over here and a stress may show what syscalls are called but might not be too much helpful in finding us the proper key. So as shown in the previous video, you can directly open this ELF in a decompiler like Ghidra and just see the pseudo code which will make your job pretty easier in the case. In this case. However, I would like to approach this solution by using the Binja cloud which is also like Ghidra and can generate the decompiled code as well as the assembly of binaries but users don't need to set it up in their local machines to work with. Let us see how it works. First go to this site, a link has been provided in this description. Now as you can see there is a paid version along with a free version. For our work, we will use the free version as it's sufficient enough and we will be using the cloud system for now. Now let us provide our credentials. And set up a new project. As you can see, we are given an option to upload our binary. So let's upload the file over here. It takes, the, it takes some time for the site to analyze the binary and give us all the information. So we should be patient enough for this to complete. Ok, now it's done. As you can see, on the left hand side, Binja gives us all the information it could extract about the functions used in the program. And as we know that any C program starts with the main function, so let's see if we can find one in here. Ok, so Binja gives us the assembly code of the main function along with the program logic and the control flow graph for this function. Now as we know assembly code starts with these two basic operations push rbp and move rbp to rsp. As you can see there is a lot of assembly code which might be intimidating for beginners but we should think cleverly and look for parts whose use we can relate to the program while running. 
This is one of the basic mantras of reversing one should always remember while reversing binaries as it helps in looking over a lot of unnecessary code and save time while doing so. See, over here a call to a scanf function is being made which we can guess must be taking the data from our input. After this line, we can see that some data is loaded from the stacks to the register. And as we can remember, stacks are used to store local variables in the memory, right? So this data must be the input that we supplied to our program. Continuing in our analysis, we can see that a compare operation is being performed between our input and some data. Here the data which is the input is actually an integer is being compared to some hex value. Basically in assembly code, most of the constants are expressed in hexadecimal format. But what we can do to make it simpler is use Binja's built-in feature to convert data to any format simpler to us. In this case, we will convert it back to an integer. To do that, just right click on the number and choose the format you want to convert it to. Now as you can see that the number is converted into decimal 4. Ok, but what now? We can see that this program is checking if the input is 4 and if it's true, it's jumping the execution to another code block. Before proceeding, see these green lines indicate what the program will do if the condition is true and the red lines indicates what the program will do otherwise. Think them of basic if else statements represented graphically. This shows the execution flow of a program as it runs and takes inputs. This is generally called a control flow graph and helps us a lot as it makes it easier for us to look at the different outcomes or paths a program might take after it performs some operation. Here you can see that after the program checks if the input is 4 and if it's true, it calls a function no cap, which as you can remember was the name of the level 4. So we are going in the right way. But what we want is the code that runs the level vault and since we supplied the input 1, these conditions will be false. So let's follow this red arrow for now until we reach a condition which compares the input with 1. Now we reached a part where the data of EX is compared to hex 1 or decimal 1. And we can see that if this condition is true, a function named vault is being called, which as you can remember was also the name of our level. So let's see what this function contains. To do so, we have to just click on the function. Here we can see some data like ECPZ, do you know, enter the key, is loaded into the registers using the LEA keyword which is just same as the MOV keyword and is used to load data into stacks or registers. We remember seeing these strings in our level, so we are at the right place. As we can see again, here's a lot of assembly code and decoding them will each take a lot of time, so let's look for anything that might interest us. Viewing the control flow graph of the whole program again, we can see that the program ultimately converges at this part of code. Before doing so, it comes through two different parts. Let me zoom in. Okay, so in one part it calls a function called granted, whereas in the other it calls a function called denied. Let us look into these programs and start with the denied function. Okay, as we can see here in this function, a call to the puts function is being made. This means this function is printing something. But printing what? Again we can see this LEA keyword is loading some data from the stacks into registers. But what is this data? Let us try to find out. For that we will try to click on it. Ok, so this data basically contains the string access denied. And as we can remember, this access denied string is printed whenever we gave the wrong key. 
So this function denied is executed whenever we supplied the false key. This must mean that the other function is executed when we supplied the correct key. So let's get back to our fault function and see what is actually happening. Ok, we can find what conditions triggered the granted function but it would be easier if we backtrack the green arrows from the code that calls the granted function. In that way, we will be focusing strictly on the conditions that triggers the wanted situation. Doing so, we can see some hex byte is compared with another byte of the stack loaded into the register. Now what we know is that we are supplying a string in the license input. So there is a high chance that this hex byte may be representing a character of the string. Let us convert it back into our desired format. Ok, so this data represents the character 9. Now let's again check which conditions triggers this condition. Doing so, we find another check condition which again checks some stack byte with another hex constant. Let us again convert back into the character format. Ok, so it's the character n. But before further proceeding, one thing must be noticed. See, the stack memory values from the data are loaded during subsequent checks all differed by a single byte and as we know, characters in C hold a memory value of 1. This must mean that we are checking our input byte by byte stored in the stack with these characters and as we know, stack grows downwards in memory. The first byte of a string resides at a lower memory address than the following bytes. And judging these addresses, we can guess this program is checking each character of the input from the first to last. Now repeating this process, we finally found the first compare case which starts off by comparing the first byte with the character Y. So now let's write down all the characters that we found from top to bottom in a text editor. Ok, so this must be our license key. So let's try it out. Ok, as we can see that we are granted the access. So you can see how we can also solve these problems without even diving deep into assembly or directly seeing the pseudocode. All we did is found our function, backtracked to the correct path and focused on key assembly operations like CMP, LEA and also found out why control flow graphs are very important while dealing in huge code bases. A nested if else CFG looks like an exact staircase or ladder pattern. Now let us see how we can approach the solution in Ghidra. We have loaded our binary and opened the main function's decompiled output over here. And we can again find a call to the vault function between these if else statements. So let's see what this function contains and see the decompiled output of this program. To do so, let's click over this function. As you can see that here, after a printf statement to enter key, the program is taking some data and comparing each character of that data with the characters of the flag we just now obtained. From this, we learn one important thing that Ghidra can sometimes make our job so much easier and reduce the time required in reversing binaries. With this, we can conclude today's video. Anyone willing to try out these levels by themselves can get the binary from the GitHub repo whose link has been given in the video description. In the next video, we will try out the next level and learn some new techniques used in reverse engineering. Till then, thank you. 
back, back, back from the dead.